This just in, closing arguments for a notorious attempted murder and kidnapping case are about to get underway. News 18's Nancy Robinson is live at the county courthouse with the latest. Nancy? Well, Jeff, the lawyer's final arguments are about to get underway in two minutes here at the county courthouse. This is a very controversial case about conspiracy to commit murder, attempted murder, kidnapping and human trafficking, and it has gotten a lot of attention. I'm told that there is not a seat left in the courthouse today. We are dealing here today with nine brothers, yes, nine brothers, who are accused of trying to kill um, a tenth brother not too far from where we are standing here today in Dotan. I had a chance to speak to the assistant district attorney as he was entering the courthouse a few minutes ago, and he contends that the nine brothers, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, and Asher had a long-standing dispute with their younger brother, Joseph. This was, he said, quote, a sibling rivalry gone awry. It all began when their father Jacob had asked Joseph to relay a message to the brothers and when Joseph had found the brothers, they did the unthinkable, leaving him stranded to die in a pit. Uh, the unusual twist in this story, in this case, uh, is that for reasons unclear, they changed their minds and decided to sell Joseph into slavery. Uh, but I also had a word earlier with the brother's defense attorney who said that his clients are completely innocent, that they had never sold Joseph, and that he will provide uh, in contestable evidence that will lead to his client's complete uh, acquittal. Following today's arguments, it will all be up to the jury who will be deliberating over this case as soon as this afternoon. Reporting live from County Courthouse, Nancy Robertson, News 18. Each of you in the audience should consider yourself to be a member of the jury who will render a verdict in this case and not simply a member of the courtroom audience passively observing the proceedings. Counsel for the prosecution will be Martin Pritikin, Dean of Concord Law School. Martin Pritikin. <laughs> Counsel for the defense will be Michael Helfand, Professor of Law at Pepperdine University. Michael Helfand. First, you will hear the arguments on behalf of the prosecution, then the arguments on behalf of the defense, then the prosecution's rebuttal, and then the defense's rebuttal. The Honorable Judge Kaufman will then instruct the jury further about legal guidelines relevant to the case and how you, the jury, should render its verdict of guilty or not guilty on each of the four charges. The very first mission of Pirkei Avot in the Talmud cautions us to be deliberate in judgment. The Rambam's commentary on this Mishnah reminds us to take time in passing judgment and avoid pronouncing the verdict hastily. New viewpoints may become evident which were not seen originally. Anyone who acts irreverently by handing down a ruling before thorough evaluation is considered a foolish, wicked, and arrogant person who may bring dishonor to the court. Please bear these teachings of our forefathers in mind as you consider your verdict in this case. Now, all rise for the Honorable Andrew Kaufman, presiding judge, and remain standing as I administer the juror's oath. You do, each of you, understand and agree that you will truly and well try the case now pending before the court and render a true verdict according only to the evidence presented to you and the instructions of the court. If you understand and agree, please say, I do. His Honor, Judge Andrew Kaufman will now proceed. Counsel ready to proceed? Yes, Your Honor. Mr. Helfand, ready to proceed? Yes, Your Honor. Mr. Pritikin, you may address the jury. Thank you, Your Honor. At this time, the people have their closing evidence to lodge with the court. Very well. May I proceed? You may. May it please the court, counsel, members of the jury. I thank you for your service in this case. I know it has been a brutal case to participate in and to witness. This case is simple, though. This case comes down to one thing, sibling rivalry. Now, this is not a case of Johnny got a bigger scoop of ice cream than I did, 
or Serena got more Grand Slam titles than I did. This is a case about deep-seated hatred and some of the most heinous crimes imaginable. Before we talk about those crimes, let's talk about who exactly the defendants are. Now, Yaakov or Jacob, also known as Israel, had 12 sons with four wives. Now, two of those sons were from his wife, Rachel. Now, Yosef, of course, is the victim in this case, so he is not one of the defendants. And his brother, Binyamin, because he was also a son of Rachel, was not included in the other brother's conspiracy. So they are not defendants. And as we'll see in a few moments, Reuven was the only one of the remaining brothers not to participate in the plot, so he is not a defendant. And that leaves the remaining nine brothers who are the defendants in this case. And what are these nine defendants charged with? There are four counts that you are to consider. One, conspiracy to commit murder. Count two is attempted murder. Count three is kidnapping. And count four is human trafficking. And we're going to talk about the elements that the prosecution needs to prove to establish that each of these charges has been proven. And we're going to talk about the evidence that shows they've been proven. Before I do that, though, I want to spend a moment talking about motive. Now, motive is not something that the prosecution needs to prove, but it's something that prosecutors typically talk about because we understand that as reasonable people, jurors know people don't commit crimes for no reasons. They have a motivation behind it. So what was the motive in this case? Motive part one. As the Torah testifies in the book of Genesis, it says Joseph would bring evil reports about his brothers to their father. Now Israel, Yaakov, loved Joseph more than all his sons since he was a child of his old age, and he made him a fine woolen tunic. Now, we're not here to debate whether that's the best parenting strategy to let your other sons know that you've got a favorite. We're here to talk about how those other sons reacted. His brothers saw that it was he whom their father loved most of all his brothers, so they hated him, and they could not speak to him peaceably. Motive part two. Joseph dreamed a dream which he told his brothers. We were binding sheaves in the middle of the field when, behold, my sheaf arose and also remained standing. Then, behold, your sheaves gathered around and bowed down to my sheaf. And his brothers said to him, Would you then reign over us? Would you then dominate us? And they hated him even more because of his dreams and because of his talk. Motive part three. He dreamed another dream and related it to his brothers. Behold, the sun, the moon, and the eleven stars were bowing down to me. And he related it to his father and his brothers. And his father scolded him. What is this dream you've dreamt? Are we to come, I and your mother and your brothers, to bow down to the ground to you? So his brothers were jealous of him. They hated him. They couldn't speak peaceably to him. They were jealous of him. And they acted on that hatred. And they acted on that jealousy. So let's now talk about the elements of those four charges. The first is conspiracy to commit murder. There are three elements. First, the defendant intended to agree and did agree with one or more other defendants to intentionally and lawfully kill. Second, defendant and one or more other alleged members of the conspiracy intended that one or more of them would intentionally and unlawfully kill. And third, that one of the defendants committed the following overt act alleged to accomplish the killing, namely throwing Yosef into a pit and leaving him there to die. So an agreement, an intent to kill, and an overt act. That's what's required for conspiracy. Now, fortunately for me as a prosecutor, the Torah makes my job easy. Because the Torah testifies, they saw him from afar, and when he had not yet approached them, they conspired against him to kill him. My job's pretty much done. And they said to one another, look, that dreamer is coming. So now come, let us kill him and throw him in one of the pits, and we will say a wild beast devoured him. Then we shall see what will become of his dreams. There's your evidence right there. Now, I mentioned before that Reuven was not included in the, as the pool of defendants, and I want to explain why. Because Reuven heard, and he rescued him, Joseph, from their hand. And he said, we will not mortally strike him. And Reuben said to them, shed no blood, throw him into this pit in the wilderness, but lay no hand on him, intending to rescue him from their hands to return him to his father. So Reuben had no actual intent to kill. The Torah tells us as much. But the other nine brothers did. That's why they are defendants, and that's why they are guilty. Now, the second charge is attempted murder. This count has two elements. The first is defendants took at least one direct but ineffective step toward killing another person, because, of course, if it was effective, you'd have a murder charge, not an attempted murder charge. And the second is that the defendants intended to kill that person. And again, the Torah tells us, so it was. When Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped Joseph of a tunic, the fine woolen tunic that was on him. They took him, cast him into the pit. The pit was empty. There was no water in it. They left him there, there to die. And then, to add insult to injury, they sat to eat food. They cast him off to die, and they ate a sandwich. Count three is kidnapping. Three elements here. 
First, defendants took, held, or detained another person by using force or instilling reasonable fear. Second is that using that force or fear, defendants moved the other person a substantial distance. And third, the other person did not consent to the movement. So we have detention, we have force or fear, and we have lack of consent. And the same evidence that established attempted murder also establishes the kidnapping. They stripped him of his tunic, they took him, moved him a substantial distance, and cast him into a pit, which was obviously against his will. That's kidnapping. The fourth count is human trafficking. This has two elements. First, defendants deprived another person of personal liberty. Here, of course, we're talking about Joseph. Or violated that other person's personal liberty. And second, when defendants acted, they intended to obtain labor, forced labor or services. So they detained him, and they did so with the intent to sell him into slavery. Again, what is the evidence that shows that these charges have been met? Well, the Torah goes on to tell us. A caravan of Ishmaelites was coming from Gilad to Egypt. Judah, Yehuda, said to his brothers, What gain will there be if we kill our brother and cover up his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, but let our hand not be upon him, for he is our brother, our own flesh. His brothers agreed. Midianite men, traitors, passed by. They drew Joseph up and lifted him out of the pit and sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver. Then they brought Joseph to Egypt. They sold him into slavery. Now, you may be thinking, wait a minute, you can't have it both ways. If they changed their minds and decided not to kill him and to sell him into slavery instead, then how could they be guilty of attempted murder? They didn't intend to kill him. But, as the Honorable Judge Kaufman is going to instruct you later in this trial, there's a law regarding attempted murder. And that law is that a person who attempts to commit murder is guilty of attempted murder even if, after taking a direct step toward the killing, he abandons further efforts to complete the crime, or his attempt fails, or is interrupted by someone or something beyond his control. So we talked with attempted murder that it was that direct but ineffective step. And that, that direct and ineffective step here was throwing him in the pit. If after throwing him into the pit, they changed their mind and decided not to leave him there until he died, that doesn't undo what they already did. There's no take backs with attempted murder. When they tried to kill him, that crime was complete, no matter what they might have done or whether they changed their minds after the fact. Now, I want to talk about concealment for a moment. Because sometimes, not only what a defendant does where the act itself is criminal, but what a defendant does after the criminal act says something about their criminal intent and their criminal actions. It says something about their consciousness of guilt. When people conceal their actions, it tells us they're guilty, and they know they're guilty, because if they weren't, they'd have nothing to hide. They'd have nothing to conceal. So what do we know what happened here? After they cast him into the pit, after they sold him into slavery, they took Joseph's tunic, slaughtered a goatling, and dipped the tunic in blood. They brought it to their father and said, We found this. Identify, if you please, is it your son's tunic or not? He recognized, and he said, My son's tunic! A savage beast has devoured him. Joseph has surely been torn to bits. Then Jacob rent his garments and placed sackcloth on his loins. He mourned for his son many days. And I'll tell you, members of the jury, if I could charge these nine defendants with breaking their poor father's heart, I would. But we'll have to settle for attempted murder and the other three counts. So we can't have a criminal trial without talking about reasonable doubt. Right? Everyone knows in a criminal case, the prosecution bears the burden of proving the elements of the charges beyond a reasonable doubt. That's my burden. It's a burden I gladly accept, and it's a burden that I'm confident that I've met. In fact, that I think I've easily surpassed. The question for you as jurors is, was this case proven beyond a reasonable doubt? And so to answer that question, you have to ask yourself, what does reasonable doubt mean? So as Judge Coffin will instruct, Proof beyond a reasonable doubt is proof that leads you with an abiding conviction that the charge is true. Maybe you find that helpful. What might be more helpful is to talk about what reasonable doubt is not. The instructions will go on to say that the evidence need not eliminate all possible doubt because everything in life is open to some possible or imaginary doubt. Is it possible that aliens made their way into the defendant's brains and that's why they did what they did? possible? 
But is that plausible? Is that a reason not to convict? No. In this case, the evidence goes well beyond a reasonable doubt. In fact, I am as confident that these defendants are guilty of the crimes with, it, with which they've been charged as I am that O.J. Simpson murdered his, uh, um, wait a minute, <laughs> might not be the best example. Let me try again. The evidence in this case is so strong that I would say it's a slam dunk. Just as much as it was a slam dunk that there were weapons of mass destruction. Um, okay, wait a minute. All right, you know what? Forget the examples. Let's focus on the bottom line. The bottom line is this. There's only one reasonable conclusion in this case, and that is the defendants hated Yosef, so they plotted to kill him, and then they sold him into slavery. And therefore, the defendants are guilty of each charge. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Pritikin. Mr. Helfen. Your Honor, at this time, I'd like to submit my evidence in closing. Mark the defense exhibit. evidence as Exhibit A and the people's evidence as Exhibit 1. Members of the jury, Your Honor, you've been told a tale this evening by a very talented attorney and good friend of mine. And that's his job today. But by finding my clients guilty today, you will be part of a smear campaign, one of the greatest biblical lies ever told that dates back thousands of years. What we've done so far today is read some text, maybe a little bit too quickly. And as a result, we've painted the victim as the ones who maybe committed a crime and the one who truly committed the crime as the victim. Now, I agree with Mr. Pritikin this morning that this case begins with a sibling rivalry. That's certainly true. But let's talk about who these people really are. Oh, we have Joseph, who rose to become second in command in the greatest civilization of the ancient world. And we have his poor brothers, who came to him and begged for food. And they're the ones who were told today are the perpetrators of a crime. Here's the truth. The truth is where this sibling rivalry begins with the desire of Joseph to seize power. Oh, the Torah, the Bible tells us this explicitly. We're told of Joseph's dream and how he said, look, your sheaves encircled my sheave and prostrated themselves to my sheaf. A metaphor for the way in which Joseph's brothers would one day bow before him. And wouldn't you know, Joseph made his dream come true. We're told in the Bible that his brothers did indeed come in for, before him and prostrated themselves before him. And Judah and his brothers came to Joseph's house and he was still there and they fell before him upon the ground. These were Joseph's great aspirations, to seize control, to become almost the king of Egypt. And this has been a part of a millennium, millennia of a smear campaign against my clients. And what began in the hills of Israel has made it even to this day to the streets of Broadway. How many people here have seen Joseph in the Technicolor Dreamcoat? Oh, raise your hands high. Ten times. Your Honor, I'd like to make a motion. And what would that be? I'd like you to dismiss from the jury all those who have seen Joseph in the Technicolor Dreamcoat. <laughs> Before you rule, Your Honor, this show contains verses like, poor, poor Joseph. Let us grab him now, do him in while we've got the time. Let us leave him here all alone and he's bound to die. Broadway's attempt to smear my clients has now made its way into the jury. Is there, any, is there anything further on your motion? That's all, Your Honor. Motion's denied. Proceed. <laughs> the deck you can see is still stacked against my clients. But that's okay, because what I will show you is that all the uh, allegations Mr. Pritikin raised here today are unsubstantiated. Conspiracy to commit murder, attempted murder, kidnapping, human trafficking. 
forgive my irreverence, a joke. Here's the truth. They're all false. Here's what you think happened. What you think happened is, the brother said, so now let us kill him, and we will cast him into one of the pits. But let me tell you what actually happened. If you look only a few verses later, what we find out is, Reuben, who Mr. Pritikin has chosen not to charge today, says, let us not kill him. And you know what the brothers decide to do instead of killing him? Well, Reuben says, do not shed blood, cast him into this pit, which is in the desert, but do not lay a hand upon him. And that's, in fact, what the brothers do. And they took him and cast him into the pit. Now, the pit was empty. There was no water in it. I'll tell you why the Bible told us there was no water in it. This is the famous commentary of the Rashbam. In reading these verses, the Rashbam noted, the reason the Bible tells us there was no water in it is because they intentionally tried to find a pit where if they sent him, he wouldn't die. If there was water in it, you know what would have happened to Joseph? He would have drowned. My clients clearly demonstrated, and the Bible provides the testimony for the fact that they did not intend to kill him. Here was the real motive why they put him in a pit. They put him in a pit because Joseph was causing some pretty serious problems. This is Rabbi Yisrael Taub famously notes, what they tried to do is, quote unquote, destroy Yosef's, Joseph's evil inclination. They wanted to teach him a lesson about the way he behaved towards them, towards their father. The attempts to seize power. His attempts to seize power were so egregious, it led the Chafetz Chaim, renowned commentator, to say, it was borderline, if not actually self-defense, this attempt of the brothers to teach him a lesson. Because had they let Joseph continue on his path, he would have enslaved them all. I object, Your Honor. There's absolutely no basis to contend that the brothers acted in self-defense. Objections overruled. Proceed. That'll show you to take issue with the Chafetz Chaim. <laughs> Outrageous. Rule 11 sanctions? Denied. Proceed. All right. Let's look at these four counts against my clients. Conspiracy to commit murder. The third element is one of the defendants committed an overt act alleged to accomplish the killing. This is patently false. They tried to teach Joseph a lesson, but they specifically put him in a pit where no harm would come to him. There's no attempt to commit murder here. The brothers listened to the wise counsel of Reuben and put him in a place where no harm would come to Joseph. And the second count, attempted murder. Again, this assumption that somehow my clients were trying to kill him, as if songs from Broadway tell us how we should rule on the fate of my clients. No one intended to kill Joseph. Now, you may say to yourselves, but what about selling Yosef into, Joseph into slavery? It didn't happen. The brothers never sold him into slavery. Take a look more closely at the text with me. Here's what you think happened. This is the text that, of course, wise prosecution presented before you. Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, we're told. This is what Joseph's brothers said to one another. But look at what happens next. Then Midianite men, merchants, passed by. And they pulled and lifted Joseph from the pit and they sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites for 20 silver pieces. And they brought Joseph to Egypt. Who sold Joseph into slavery? Does the Bible say the brothers sold him? Surely not. It says the Midianite men. They are the ones who sold Joseph into slavery. Surely my clients are not responsible to what marauding Midianite men decided to do that day. I'm not the only one, of course, who's noticed this. The Rashbam once and again notes Midianite men because they sat to eat bread, the brothers, while they waited to teach Joseph a little bit of a lesson. They were far from the pit. Midianites passed and saw Yosef in the pit, and they pulled him up and sold him. Maybe they should have paid a little bit closer attention while they ate. But that's not a crime. And so when Mr. Pritikin our prosecutor says, oh, kidnapping. And he says, using that force or fear, the defendants move the other person a substantial distance, as if to imply 
my clients took Joseph and moved him far away so no one could ever get to him. And this is surely not true. I mean, this is a sibling squabble. It's not kidnapping. Dropping Yosef in the pit was the ancient equivalent of locking your brother in his room. <laughs> what do you think they had rooms? Uh, they had pits. That's where, you, that's where you hung out. And teaching him a lesson in a pit nearby with nothing dangerous in it is not moving the other person a substantial distance. We're not going to prosecute every sibling squabble, are we? There's no using that force or fear. The defendants move the other person a substantial distance. What about that last count? Once again, you've been duped. When defendants acted, they intended to obtain forced labor or services. This was never the case for my clients. It's genuinely an outrage. They're not guilty again. Here's the bottom line, members of the jury. Yosef liked to show up his family. His brothers tried to teach him a lesson, a lesson he desperately needed. In fact, Yosef's behavior may have been so dangerous and egregious that it amounted to self-defense. No crimes, though, were committed. They weren't trying to kill him. They didn't try to take him off somewhere and sell him. The lesson they tried to tell him, teach him may have gone south, as sometimes sibling squabbles do. But for some sort of lesson, some sort of sibling, sibling squabble to go south is surely not a crime, notwithstanding everything that the prosecution has told you here today. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Helfand. Mr. Pritikin, response. Thank you, Your Honor. How dare they? How dare they try and blame the victim and paint him as the criminal? Being ambitious is not a crime. Being boastful is not a crime. Throwing your brother in a pit, leaving him there to die, that's the crime. Now, defense counsel tries to say, well, they never really intended to kill him. They just intended to teach him a lesson. And as evidence of that, supposedly, he cites to the fact that Reuven tried to talk them out of killing him. There's only one problem with that. As the Torah later tells us, later on, when they have their troubles down in Egypt, and they're wallowing in their sorrow about all the misfortune that has befallen upon them, Reuben speaks up to them and says, this is happening to you because of the evil that you did. And he says, did I not speak to you saying, do not sin against the boy? But you would not listen. And his blood as well, behold, is being avenged. The defense can't invoke Reuben's effort to talk them out of it when he didn't actually succeed in talking them out of it. They did intend to kill him. They didn't just intend to teach him a lesson. And in fact, they nearly did kill him. Rav Shmuel ben Hafni Goen testified that the reason the Torah tells us that Joseph was sold to the Ishmaelites for only 20 pieces of silver, which was a relatively bargain price, was because he'd been thrown in the pit and was near death as a result of starvation. And so it was worth little. How long do you think they left him in that pit if he was near starvation? That's not five minutes. That's not an hour. That's a long time. That's not just teaching someone a lesson. That's teaching someone the ultimate lesson. What's more, defense counsel argues that they somehow did Joseph a favor by casting him into a pit where there was no water so he wouldn't drown. However, the Midrash and Huma, one of the oldest commentaries on the Torah, says that in fact the reason why the Torah tells us there was no water in the pit is to let us know that there was no water, but there were snakes and scorpions in it. Does that sound like locking someone in their room? I've seen some dirty rooms. I've seen some bugs in there. Snakes and scorpions? That's not just a simple sibling squabble, members of the jury. That's an attempt to kill. Now, defense counsel goes so far as to argue that the defendants were somehow acting in self-defense, that they had to kill Joseph or try to kill him because of what he was doing to them. But there's a problem. Rabbi Ovadia ben Yaakov Sforno testifies that it is true they believe they were justified because they consider Joseph a pursuer. And one who kills another is blameless. But, he goes on to say, when is someone who acts in self-defense blameless? When there's no available alternative to save the life of the pursued. 
Did they really have no alternative to casting Joseph into a pit if he's trying to become a ruler over them or trying to spread rumors about them? Here's a reasonable alternative. Talk to their father and say, hey, do something about Joseph. He's out of control. Or here's another alternative. Talk to Joseph. Confront him and say, it's not right what you're doing. Knock it off. They didn't do that. They cast him in a pit. They left him there to die. Now, defense counsel then tries to deal with the selling of Joseph by saying, well, it wasn't even the defendants at all. It's the one me defense. But again, we have witnesses who testify to the contrary. The Abarbanel, one of the most distinguished sages in Jewish history, has stated that the brothers sinned a great sin through their baseless hatred of Joseph, through their throwing him into the pit, and their selling him into slavery. Not the Midianites, the brothers. In fact, Rabbi Moshe Hadarshan, nearly a millennium ago, testified that the brothers not only sold Joseph, but when they did so, they transgressed the provision, pr prohibition, do not steal a man and sell him. So to turn a phrase from the O.J. Simpson trial and actually make it work for me, if they threw him in the pit, you must not acquit. <laughs> and that's what they did. Now, not only did they commit these crimes, they admitted they committed these crimes. The Torah says that later when they were in Egypt trying to talk about why have all these misfortunes befallen us, and they realized it was because of what they had done, and they said, indeed, we are guilty considering our brother. And again, the Abarbanel says in so many words that they admitted their guilt when they said, we are guilty concerning our brother. We have a bald-faced admission. In fact, there's another admission but that's not so explicit, but I think it's worth, worth mentioning. So, if you've seen The Godfather, you know that Fredo was involved in a plot to try and kill his brother Michael Corleone. If you haven't seen it, sorry there's no spoiler alert. It's been out for about 40 years, so you had your chance. Right? And it wasn't successful. Michael survived, and he knew that Fredo was involved. And he considered getting revenge. But what he said to his associate was, I don't want anything to happen to Fredo while my mother's alive. Once she's dead, mm, all bets are off. There's strikingly similar language at the end of the book of Genesis. Once Yaakov, their father, dies, Joseph's brothers perceived that their father was dead, and they said, perhaps Joseph will nurse hatred against us, and then he will surely repay us all the evil we did him. So his brothers went and flung themselves before Joseph and they said, we are ready to be your slaves. Think about that, members of the jury. They didn't just say, we're really sorry. They didn't just say, okay, you get one good punch at me. They said, we're ready to be your slaves. Why would they say that? They said it because they tried to kill him and then they sold him. And they were afraid that he was going to do to them exactly what they did to him. They didn't want him to kill them, so they went for the alternative option behind door two, okay, better than being killed, we'll offer ourselves up as slaves. They offered to do that for him because that's exactly what they had done to him. Were these great men? Yes, they were. Did they make a great error in judgment and commit a great wrong? Yes, they did. You, members of the jury, can right that wrong. You can do the right thing, and I have confidence that you will. Find them guilty. Do your duty. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pritikin. Mr. Helfand, your final comments. I'm not sure how best to defend my clients when the Godfather and Joseph and the Technicolor Dreamcoat are aligned against me. <laughs> but not, do not be duped by these attempts to invoke Hollywood to tell some sort of narrative once again that does not befit the character of my clients. This is all misdirection, like a magician's show. Admissions of guilt. None exist. And they couldn't exist because there is no guilt. The prosecution has no case. They can't prove the elements of the crimes. And in fact, Joseph's brothers were justified in their behavior. So instead, what you get is misdirection. What else could you get? When you can't argue the facts, argue the law. When you can't argue the law, argue the facts. When you can't do either, invoke the Godfather. <laughs> Here's what you have in Genesis. And they said to one another, indeed, we are guilty for our brother. Yeah, they feel guilty because they witnessed the distress of his hold when he begged us. They, they felt bad. 
Who wouldn't feel bad? I tried to teach my brother a lesson, and you know what? He ended up getting sold as a slave. It's not, I didn't do it, but they wouldn't even be human if they didn't feel badly about it. Surely we're not going to convict them of a crime today, the crime of being human. I'd like to think even in the state of California, that's not a crime. There's no admission of guilt there. This is precisely what the Sephorno, who the prosecution has already cited to. They didn't mean they were guilty for Yosef's sale or death, but guilty of being cruel. Yes, brothers can be cruel, and brothers can make mistakes, but that doesn't mean brothers are guilty of crimes. That's just really what <laughs> brothers do. Yeah, they felt perhaps Joseph will hate us and return to us all the evil that we did to him. And so they said, behold, we are your slaves. Yeah, they did evil to him. They threw him in a pit. That's not a great thing to do. If I were saying, hey, I, got a bro I have a brother, Jacob. I said, hey, Jacob, what should we do today? And if he said back to me, I have an idea. Why don't I throw you in a pit? That's not a good thing. That's not like a good thing to do on a Tuesday. But... And you can feel guilty about doing stupid stuff like that. But that surely isn't a crime. These admissions of guilt don't exist. They tried to teach him a lesson, and while they weren't looking and they were eating a sandwich, Joseph got sold into slavery. But they're not guilty for the crimes committed by Midianite men. Why aren't they being prosecuted? Yeah, prosecution can't find them. They're not in this court's jurisdiction right now. So why not throw my clients once again, repeatedly for thousands of years, under the bus? A little oopsie-daisy. Not a crime. Here's the bottom line today, members of the jury. Joseph came out the big winner in all this. Let's be honest. At the end of the day, what happened? He just got to be second in command in the greatest civilization in the ancient world. And after all that, it wasn't enough. His dreams came true, and he still continued to perpetrate this fraud and this lie. From his perch on high, he still wanted to, his brothers to know, I own you guys. And so he dragged them before this court. He's the leader of the ancient world, and yet we're still trying to stick it to his brothers. There's no crime, no harm, and self-defense. Let me tell you how to paraphrase Johnny Cochran. If the text doesn't fit, you must acquit. <laughs> Yosef's belligerent behavior justified the brothers' attempt to teach him a lesson, and that's the bottom line, and that is all they did. And I want to leave you with one final point. You know, commentators have said for centuries, this entire saga was part of God's plan to get the Jewish people down to Egypt and eventually take them out as his people. This is what the Malbim centuries ago said. God orchestrated all this. It's part of how Jewish nationhood would be created. God even made the brothers think that they were doing the right thing by teaching Yosef a lesson. And that's truly what the brothers thought. And if I can leave you with one thought, it's the following. Don't get in the way of God's plan. Don't say here today they're trying to teach him a lesson as part of this arc of history. Let's convict them of these absurd crimes. No, they were part of an important plan that brought us here today to be here as one people, as a nation. And without this story, none of this would be possible. These weren't crimes. These were divinely orchestrated attempts by brothers who thought they were doing the right thing. Joseph has already gotten all he needed. He's got Broadway shows. He's got a perch on high. He doesn't need to be able to stick it one last time to his brothers. There's no crime, just God's plan. Thank you, Mr. Helfand. The nine defendants in this case, Shimon, Levi, Yehuda, God, Asher, Dan, Naphtali, Yisrachar, and Zebulon are charged with four counts. Conspiracy to commit murder, attempted murder, kidnapping, and human trafficking. 
I will now explain the presumption of innocence and the people's burden of proof. The defendants have pleaded not guilty to the charges. The fact that a criminal charge has been filed against the defendants is not evidence that the charge is true. You must not be biased against the defendants just because they have been arrested, charged with crimes, or brought to trial. A defendant in a criminal case is presumed to be innocent. This presumption requires that the people prove a defendant guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. Whenever I tell you the people must prove something, I mean they must prove it beyond a reasonable doubt. Proof beyond a reasonable doubt is proof that leaves you with an abiding conviction that the charge is true. The evidence need not eliminate all possible doubt because everything in life is open to some possible or imaginary doubt. Unless the evidence proves the defendants guilty beyond a reasonable doubt, they are, they are entitled to an acquittal and you must find them not guilty. The defendants are charged in count one with conspiracy to commit murder. Murder is the intentional and unlawful killing of a human being. To prove that the defendants are guilty of this crime, the people must prove that a defendant intended to agree and did agree with one or more of the other defendants to intentionally and unlawfully kill. At the time of the agreement, the defendant and one or more of the other alleged members of the conspiracy intended that one or more of them would intentionally and unlawfully kill, and one of the defendants committed the following overt act alleged to accomplish the killing, and that is throwing Yosef into a pit and leaving him there to die. An overt act is an act by one or more of the members of the conspiracy that is done to help accomplish the agreed upon crime. The overt act must happen after the defendant has agreed to commit the crime. The overt act must be more than the act of agreeing or planning to commit the crime, but it does not have to be a criminal act in and of itself. Someone who merely accompanies or associate with, with, associates with members of a conspiracy but who does not intend to commit the crime is not a member of the conspiracy. Defendants are charged in count two with attempted murder. To prove that the defendants are guilty of attempted murder, the people must prove that the defendants took at least one direct but ineffectual step towards killing another person and the defendants intended to kill that person. A person who attempts to commit murder is guilty of the attempted murder even if after taking a direct step toward killing, he or she abandons further efforts to complete the crime or his or her attempt fails or is interrupted by someone or something beyond his or her control. On the other hand, if a person freely and voluntarily abandons his or her plans before taking a direct step toward committing the murder, then that person is not guilty of attempted murder. The defendants are charged in count three with kidnapping. To prove that the defendants are guilty of this crime, the people must prove that the defendants took, held, or detained another person by using force or by instilling reasonable fear. Using that force or fear, the defendants moved the other person a substantial distance and the other person did not consent to the movement. In order to consent, a person must freely and voluntarily and know the nature of the act. Must act freely and voluntarily and know the nature of the act. The defendants are charged in count four with human trafficking. To prove that the defendants are guilty of this crime, the people must prove that the defendants either deprived another person of personal liberty or violated that other person's personal liberty and when the defendants acted, they intended to obtain forced labor or services. Each count in this case charges a distinct crime. You must consider each count separately. The defendants may be found guilty or not guilty of any or all of the crimes charged. Your finding as to each count must be stated in a separate verdict. Mr. Bailiff. Now this is a high-tech courtroom, and therefore the jury will be voting through your cell phones. I will now read the verdict of the jury. We, the jury, in the case of People versus Joseph's Brothers, find as follows. On the charge of conspiracy to commit murder, not guilty. On the charge, on the charge of attempted murder, not guilty. 
on the charge of kidnapping, guilty. On the charge of human trafficking, not guilty. This matter is certified to the Court of Ultimate Jurisdiction for further proceedings. If you liked that video, hit the subscribe button and notification bell below for hours of the best Jewish content online.